Uh, I'm the first person in history stupid enough to have walked to both bloody poles. Let's get that straight. And if you are that person, and I am, I promise you that Rob Swan is only sure of four things. First and foremost, I'm sure I hate walking. I've done enough. Secondly, I do not enjoy having ice in my underpants, which happens at minus 70. Thirdly, no insurance company on the planet will ever give me life insurance. You'll understand why. And lastly, which I think is really important, that most people say I'm going to fail and that I'm going to die. And good leadership, in my humble opinion, is all about being the positive person around the table. So, where did this all begin? This began for me as a dream at the age of 11. Can we do something with the lights down a bit? Check out that haircut, bit strange. Uh, and I saw a film at the age of 11. Lights down, please, a bit. Uh, I saw a film at the age of 11 that inspired me to do this. So guys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, do not forget your dreams. Hold on to them. And that dream took me to the South Geographic Pole. I actually am the first person in history to walk to both poles, regardless of whether it was unassisted in my underpants backwards or whatever. I was just the first person to do it. And this began on the edge of Antarctica, uh, where we lay out our equipment. And this is 30 years ago. So we carried no radio communications, no sort of internet connection that wasn't invented, no iPhone 7. We had no fancy satellite equipment where it tells you are on Earth. Three of us just started walking from the edge of the Antarctic, 900 nautical miles to one building about the size of this room, the South Pole Scientific Station. So if we make a mistake, we can't ring up mummy for help. We're on our own. If you fall into a crevasse, you do not come home. Uh, often we'd have to wear spikes on our feet, uh, crampons. And in this picture, we're standing in an area the size of the United States of America. And we're the only people there. A bit lonely. And beneath our feet, 90% of all the world's ice. 70% of all the world's fresh water. So mark my words, if we continue to melt this, we swim. No question about that. As we get nearer the pole, our ship that had dropped us off a year later comes back to Antarctica. A plane will fly to the pole to collect us. We go back to the base. We load everything up and we head north. My patron for this expedition, and I please hope and pray you remember his name, was the great Jacques Cousteau. And Jacques Cousteau helped me do this, but he asked me to leave Antarctica clean and tidy, take away our rubbish, take away our equipment. Last few days to the pole, bingo, we got there. Three of us went, yes, we've done it. Yes, it's pointless to walk to both poles, I know that. <laughs> but we were proud of what we'd done. And be proud of who you are and what you are in life. Don't go through life saying like this. Brace up. Be proud. And as we were standing there, the base commander said, Sorry, lads, your ship just sank five minutes ago. <laughs> sort of thing you want to hear when you've walked 900 miles that your ship has sunk. Now remember, I'd made a promise to the great Jacques Cousteau that we would take away our base camp and equipment. No ship, 3,000 miles swim home. Now in life, you will read a lot of leadership and teamwork books. I'll save you the money. <laughs> leadership is about one simple thing in my humble opinion. Think carefully before you make a commitment in life. And once you make it, do it. Because no one will listen to you twice. And we've made a promise to Jacques Cousteau, and we would deliver on that promise, of which I'm very proud. A team would stay another year in Antarctica, and eventually we took another ship, cleared out that rubbish, and left Antarctica clean and tidy, because that's what we said 
we were going to do. And that cost me, at the age of 28, a personal debt to the bank of $1.2 million. And I'd never had a job. I've still never had a job. And it took 10 years to repay it. But the game was afoot. Now, I went, I went to the... South Pole, because it went down well with girls at parties. You know, I didn't go to the South Pole to save the planet. I just went there. But something happened to me that brought me here. My eyes changed color through damage in 70 days. Our skin blistered away. We didn't know why. When we got home, we were told that we'd walked under the hole in the ozone layer by NASA. The same time it was discovered, ultraviolet rays down, hit the ice, burnt us. Now, I'm not an explorer. I'm not a scientist. I'm not clever enough. And I'm not an environmentalist. I don't like that word. I'm a good survivor, though. I'm good at staying alive. And I began to think that some of these issues about our survival on Earth might not be somebody else's problem. Maybe they could be my problem. But first, there was a bit more walking. This time, we got to walk to the North Pole, 700 miles on foot, eight of us from seven nations. It is completely pointless and extremely hard and horrible to walk to the North Pole. This would be our tent. We're on a frozen sea every step. Check out Daryl on the right, how much he loved Rupert's music. Not much. <laughs> Here's me coming in from washing at minus 60 Celsius. Now, gentlemen, <laughs> you will notice, gentlemen, that there is absolutely nothing hanging down in the central area. <laughs> it is your job, gentlemen to explain to our esteemed ladies later, <laughs> not now, why this happens to a naked man at minus 60. Let's just say it's a bit cold. <laughs> Anyhow, we're now 600 miles from the nearest land, and the only thing we hadn't planned for happened. The entire ocean starts to break up beneath our feet four months before it ever had. And do remember, we're British-led. So we don't have some CNN camera crew filming us. You know, the Weather Channel aren't there interviewing us. No Russian submarine in case we get our feet wet. So we're basically dead. And this ice broke up four months, 25 years ago, before it ever had. And on this day, I realized something that we can't dominate the power of our planet. It can just slap us really, really hard and take us out. We need to respect it. It's more powerful than us. And I'm sorry to show you this picture, but we're fairly real. When things go wrong, people lose heels off their foot. And they've got to walk for... 115 miles on that. We're not some survivor discovery program where you can do a bit of surviving and then check into the four seasons in the evening. Nice pillows. Pretty hectic. And after 56 days, we, not me, got there. We've done it. And we flew what I think is still a hugely important flag. Our flag. Got back home, thought I'd go and have a cup of tea, go and see my mum, who, by the way, is 101 years old in October. Yes! Um, and girls, I'm her number seven child. Imagine having me as number seven. It wasn't easy. Uh, thought I'd go and see mum, have some tea, chill for a while. But no, Jack Cousteau said, Rob, what are you doing for the next 50 years? I thought, well, I'm about to find out. And he gave me, 25 years ago, a 50-year mission. In the year 2041, 25 years from now, the treaty that preserves Antarctica can stop, it can be altered, it could change. Right now, all of you own Antarctica. 
each of you have a piece of Antarctica the size of a football pitch. It's yours. All of us on earth have a responsibility for our tiny little piece. And wouldn't it be just great if we had the sense to leave one place alone on earth forever? Sounds good, doesn't it? But you know something? It's possible because we all own it. It's a chance. It's the last chance. Been on it for 25 years, and that's why I'm standing here, because you'll be voting in 2041. I'll still be causing a few problems in 2041. Zimmer frame with skis on, perhaps. But, you know, it's down to you. So over the last 25 years, all I've done is to involve you. Young people from different nations down to the Antarctic, we've cleared 1,500 tons of garbage left in Antarctica by the former Soviet Union. That only took eight years, $10.5 million. The idiot here had to raise, but anyhow, we got on it. Took us eight years, because you can only go there three months a year. Took down a ship, loaded it up by hand, and then I'm proud to say we recycled that back in the country of Uruguay, South America. Guys and girls, you don't need any more information. Maybe we could all do with a little bit of inspiration. And that's the deal. Do stuff. And on this day, I realized something, that the only way to save Antarctica would actually be because of money. Why would we go there to exploit it for fossil fuels? How do we stop people going there? Simple. Make it not financially viable to go there. Easy to do that. Use cl more clean, renewable energy here. Save energy here. Use different types of fuels here. Drive the cost down of that. And bingo, we can save Antarctica. As we came out from the Antarctic, the Larsen BI shelf 10, 12 years ago said, hello, everybody, we're melting. Uh, every year, and I'm just back two weeks ago, uh, I take people just like you uh, to the Antarctic. This expedition we've just been on, uh, I had 140 people from 31 different nations and girls. Yes, more women than men because men, sorry, Women are more sustainable than men. It's just a fact. I don't look English colored. Normally, English people look more like this color. I look like this because I just lived four years in India. Because there are 1.4 billion people in, in India, there's 1.3 billion people in China. These are the powers of the future. We must work with them. We can't ignore these fantastically powerful nations. And girls, I hope you're proud. You know, people don't join the dots on the Middle East. There are 150 million unemployed young people in the Middle East. And young people without hope, they go the wrong way. I would. So what do boys think about most? Girls. So we've involved some fantastic women, over 80 of them, to Antarctica, from the Middle East, from countries, they go back home with lots of hope, lots of talk, and lots of good stuff on the environment. Uh, and, you know, we saw a few rough waves not so long ago. Go and see the old penguins. They're all, always fun. But we see a lot of ice that shouldn't be there. If people say climate change isn't happening, come with me to the Antarctic. Two weeks ago was the hottest day ever recorded in Antarctica by NASA. And we were there. It's a bit hot. We need to listen. India. Anybody from India here? Fantastic. Do I love your country or what? But to be relevant, I did 5,000 miles around India on a bicycle, which is far more dangerous than walking to both poles in your underpants backwards. <laughs> but, young people, never forget this word, relevant. Try and be relevant in life. It's often easy to think you're being relevant and being British, going around India in some suit in a limousine wouldn't be relevant. Being on a fat old Englishman on a bike, it was relevant. 
They loved it. We built an education station, a bit more biking, went up to the Himalayas, they're melting, built an education station only running on renewable energy in the Himalayas. And this young man was quite pleased to have his first electric light, but coming from solar. Opening our first education station in the USA, coming quickly to the end of the story before the real event, which is following me. And, you know, we can make a difference. The hole in the ozone is fixing itself because people got together and did it. There is hope. I thought I might have a holiday. Then NASA called me and saying, Rob, now bigger areas of the Antarctic are starting to disintegrate. Why aren't people listening? I said, because you're probably being boring <laughs> and negative. So, unfortunately, when you've got this level of ice that could come into the ocean, it's time to act. Huge areas. So, unfortunately, more walking is necessary. <laughs> Anyhow, it's the best I can think of doing. I hope some of you have read about my best friend, Bertrand Picard, who has the courage to be flying around the world in a solar plane right now. Amazing. And using that technology... Uh, we're going to survive only on renewable energy, and we're going to be making a 650-mile journey in Antarctica. But first, uh, this November, we're going down to the Antarctic to test out some of these technologies. Some of you should certainly come with me. It's not for Tarzans and Amazons. It's for people who care. I take people to the Antarctic who've never seen snow. They're more relevant. And then my son... Uh, and I will be making this journey, testing out how we can melt ice and snow into hot water. Sounds easy, not so easy. Testing out different types of biofuels at the same time. I'm looking forward to having a cup of tea powered by maggot, uh, maggot fuel, I might say. Uh, and there's my son. He's volunteered at 21 to come and walk with his father. He's a rude bastard. He said to me, Dad... You can deal with the old people. I shall do my best to uh, communicate with the young people. Anyhow, that's the way it goes. Uh, and we're off to walk at the end of next year another 600 miles. I'd just like to be able to say that you're in for a real treat. Somewhere here is one of the best people in the world, Jonathan Porritt. Are you here? Jonathan, you'll be speaking. He's speaking to you this afternoon. And Jonathan wrote the best book I've ever read about the future. Because it starts in the future, and it's called The World We Made. You're in for a treat this afternoon. Uh, guys and girls, that's our story, right, so far. And uh, please, uh, don't be used by this technology. Use it. Use it. Don't be used by it. And I would now, and it's been really looking forward to this, uh, to introduce the result. You know, life is pretty boring if you don't get results. And where is Parker? I can't see him. Where? He's about to... Oh, he's going to wave. Ah, oh, there he is, Parker. Now, about five or six years ago, Parker came on our ship to the Antarctic. And he's a great guy, and I thought, yeah, he'll go away and be a fantastic young leader. Parker did actually far more than I've done. He's been to the North Pole. He's made amazing journeys to the South Pole. But not for him, but for climate change. He's looked very seriously at data. I'm not really good at data, but, but Parker is good at data. And he is currently at Yale, correct, Parker? Uh, and he's going to Berkeley or Stanford, one of those fancy places. Where are you going? Berkeley. Well, it's might be posh, really, isn't it? Um, and, you know, he's the real deal. Uh, he's, he's what I hope and pray young people can become. So with no further ado, Parker, uh, please come up to the stage and let me uh, introduce you. There's one more slide in my slideshow that seems to have abandoned ship. Anyhow, 